Um, kia ora everyone, welcome, thanks for having me. I've, um, it's funny, I've been down here a lot lately because I'm working with Lincoln on whatever the future of Lincoln might look like and I'm going to assume there's quite a few Lincoln grads in the room. So this morning we were out there really thinking about the purpose of Lincoln University and what I found fascinating about it was that um, we've got this you know, institution just down the road and yet for a lot of farmers it's like once they've graduated they almost never go back and so we've been talking a lot over there about what the future of farming looks like and for me um, one of the biggest things that I think is going to change in farming is actually some of the business models of farming. So I'm a geek through and through, left university, started my first technology company when I was um, you know, barely into double digits and, um, and in my 20s I grew quite a large company and sold that to Southern Cross Health Insurance and then I came down here to Christchurch where I was CEO of Pay Global which at the time um, was the second largest software company in New Zealand. And so my background is much more in tech and, and what happens then is people think I'm going to talk about tech and I am going to talk a bit about tech and I'm going to talk a wee bit about tech on farm but mostly what I want you to think about is these new technologies that come along, they only really start to work when we figure out how we're going to make money out of them. So things like virtual reality, I don't know if anyone wants to have a guess but, but virtual reality, those goggles that make you kind of, as my daughter said, they're more immersive but they make you look stupider. Um, I know, oh, classic. Um, so those, those goggles, they were patented in 1956. 1956. And what's happened is that's been a technology kind of looking for a home ever since 1956. And, and I'm going to hazard, because there's a few of you who are my age in the room, I'm going to hazard that some of you had a Viewmaster. Do you remember that? Like, oh my God, I wanted someone so desperately for Christmas. I can remember begging my parents for it and I didn't get one. I got a book and I was like, oh my God, how old school is that, you know? Uh, but the Viewmaster beat virtual reality for about 20 years. And so one of the things I've really learned is working in technology and these days I work almost entirely as a futurist in the future of food and agriculture. And one of the things I've really, really learned is that there are no facts in the future. So we can all have whatever opinions we want about the future, but until they've happened, we're all just making some kind of educated or maybe just opinionated guess, okay? So anything I say to you today about the future is just an educated and or opinionated guess, okay? Uh, I have all kinds of qualifications in doing it, which doesn't actually make it any better. I just want to tell you that. So, so I love the idea that the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So I want to go back, in 1956 when those guys patented those headsets, they thought that this was the future, and they didn't think it was the future of entertainment. They thought it was the future of visualisation for engineering development largely, that you would be able to imagine machines in 3D and therefore be able to design them better. And interestingly, um, I'm on the board of an architecture firm and we do use 3D goggles in those ways and we use them to help our clients see what their building might look like when it's finished. But the primary use of those VR goggles is actually gaming. And there wasn't a gaming industry back in 1956 when they were developed. There was a bit of a movie industry, but 3D even for the movies wasn't something that they really thought about that much. And anyway, they had those ridiculous like blue and green goggle things that they, they, they worked just fine. So why would you need any technology to change it? And what I'd say is that we usually resist new technology quite a lot, and I actually think it's fair enough that we resist new technology, because most of the new technology isn't designed by people who are going to use it. Most new technology is designed by the kinds of guys who work for me who are, you know, wear their best t-shirt to the interview. If you can get them out of jandals, it's fantastic. They sit next to each other, instant messaging each other because they're not taking their headphones off to have a conversation. You know, you, you know who these guys are, right? And I, I live in that world, and I've been in that world. Um, I went to St. Matthew's in Masterton. Some of you might know it's now part of the Rathkill Senior College. And because I was the only girl who wanted to do computer science, I got bussed out to Rathkill and I was the only girl in my class, in fact, the only girl in my year at Rathkill. And when I looked around at those guys, it turned out there were actually only three of us, even in that computer science class, who went on to do anything in computer science. So I want you to have a look at this picture, and this is 1900 in New York City. 
And in that little red circle is the person with the first car. And not to be sexist about this, but it was a guy. So here's the guy in the first car. Now, can you imagine what all these people with horses were saying about this guy? I mean, really, what a moron, right? Total moron. Like, this is never going to catch on. We've got perfectly good horses. They eat hay. They produce me compost. Like, they're super easy to run. They don't go on strike. They're really easy. Like, you can see that the whole discussion around the horse was just like, what idiot would change? And, and just recently, I got shown a 1903 um, document from the planning department in Manhattan in New York City. And they explained that the island of Manhattan would never be completely built on because there were not enough horses to move the construction materials to where they would need to go. I know, amazing, eh? So we can look back and go, wow, that's kind of a weird way to think about the future. But at this point, there were no petrol stations, right? So the guy here who owned this car, he had to send someone down with a horse and buggy to the port, <laughs> I'm serious, to collect barrels of oil. And so then he had to store those barrels of oil in the stables with the horses, and then somebody had to pour it in. And because also, like, cars were scary, right? You had to have the guy with the flag who wandered along in front of it so you didn't scare pedestrians and so on. So you can imagine, like, the whole infrastructure to make cars work just didn't happen, yeah? And so if I was a betting person in 1900, I was going to assume that this is going to be a bit like the goggles. Might take on at some point, bit stupid, really. You know, nice, all those geeks, boffins, working away with their Victorian machines. Not going to happen. And what happened, of course, is within 13 years, this is the same street, same day of the year, um, different angle, of course, and there is apparently a horse still in here. I've never managed to find it. Um, and what I'd say, what happened in that time is that all of the infrastructure that made cars possible happened. So you've got to think there were no traffic lights, there were particularly good road rules, you know, all these things had to come along in order to make it work. And I want us to think a bit about that because there's been a lot of opportunity for technology on farm, but without rural broadband, it was never going to happen, right? And that's exactly the same to me as how was I going to get the petrol into my car? Or without 5G actually rolled out all over the country, all this Internet of Things thing that I'm going to talk about in a minute, how the hell does that work? You know, and, and I was on a, a, a group of geeks in California two years ago where what we were trying to do was work out whether we could attach receivers to all of the cows and use the cows as a mesh block. So basically, they would each cow would be a Wi-Fi like enhancing system. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't understand why, but no one was prepared to fund us to see if we could commercialise it. Oh, it was a brilliant idea. Um, so, so you can see that like all of these new ideas, they actually need new infrastructure around them. It's not just that a technology wins. It's actually a whole system has to develop around them. So I'm not going to make you put your hand up because I've done it too many times before in other rooms full of people, but let me say this. If you still have an AOL account, you need to go home and get your grandchildren to set you up on a different system, okay? Because this is the international symbol for hack me, okay? Um, so I had an AOL account back in the, you know, 1980s. Um, actually, early 90s, I got my AOL account. <coughs> And what happened then was I transferred to it from a system that I used at IBM, and IBM charged me $40 a month, and it was amazing. I could send 40 electronic messages for that $40 a month, and then, wait for it, $10 a month a message, okay? Now, some of you will be thinking, oh my God, that's ridiculous. But when I looked at that, that was so much better than mail. I was utterly prepared to pay that because I was a geek, and I've been on the internet since 1986. So for me, being able to do that kind of messaging was really, really useful. And when AOL came along, they offered me a $39.95 a month all I could eat email account. And I was over there in a second. There was nothing going to keep me at that IBM system. And IBM's system was long gone, right? Dead. But something happened to AOL in the early 2000s. So, so this is their revenue from 2007 to 2009. Is this a good curve or a bad curve? What do you reckon? You want to be one of the owners of AOL at this point? No, it's a terrible curve. And, and so one of the things I want you to take away from today is I want you to have a look at some of these curves. Because I'm a math freak, so I like the numbers. But you know, you don't have to be much of a math freak to look at this and go, ooh, I think that company's in a bit of trouble, right? 
bit of trouble. Um, so does anyone want to have a guess what was happening to AOL in this time? There's another company came along called Google. And this is Google's revenue in exactly the same period. Good curve, bad curve. Good curve, right? Really good curve. And so what happened here was that Google said, oh, all you can eat for $39.95, we can do that for free. And so, man, I am out of that AOL account just like that. And the board of AOL, what do you reckon they said? Oh, you're a bunch of morons. Seriously, a bunch of morons. Like, why? We're making perfectly good money out of this $39.95 thing. Why would you offer it for free? And so the board of AOL looked at it and they just went, that is stupid. And pretty much every time a board of directors, and I'm a professional director, most of the time when we see a new business model, we see new ways of making money in our industry, we go, they don't understand. They don't get it. And of course what happened is AOL got sold off for almost nothing and is worth pretty much nothing. Uh, and Google has continued to go from strength to strength. And Google worked out that what they could do was 10 cents at a time. That first billion dollars over there that they did in re revenue, um, they did it 10 cents at a time selling advertising. And you can see why AOL went, that's just ridiculous. You can't make a billion dollars 10 cents at a time. But you know, they pretty much now, um, over this, they're, they're making 10, 20 times this, 10 cents at a time. And so I'm not saying that the um, advertising revenue model is going to work for them forever, because it certainly hasn't. It plateaued out, and they found other ways to make money. But what it did was it wasn't the technology. There was nothing special about the way that Gmail worked in terms of email. It was exactly the same technology as AOL. But what they found was they found a different business model. They found a different way of the money flowing through that business, and that's what made that company win. So. Uh, a couple of years ago I was speaking at the Environment Leaders Conference um, uh, at the Farmers Day for Fed Farmers and, um, and I put this slide up and I started to laugh, it's like I am never putting that in my mouth. Now I want to be clear, I am not, okay, so just in case there's any confusion. So this is lab grown meat, um, it's cultured meat, so basically what they do is they take fetal calf cells and then they clone them. Um, I don't know if you want to think about the business model for this. But these guys are after three markets, and they're really, really clear about the markets they're after. So the first one is old people's homes, the second one is prisons, and the third is schools. Now, does anyone want to tell me what those three have in common? Yeah, you have no choice over what you eat. Okay, so these are, this is where commodity food is going. What these guys are trying to do is get to the point where they can clone fetal calf cells and make kind of mints out of it and make it for the cheapest end of the market. Now I want you to think about that because it's really easy. I did exactly what I said those like people at AOL and the people who were laughing at the car did. I pointed at it and I laughed and I went, I'm never eating that. Now I truly am never eating it. But I've learned now over these last two years not to dismiss it. Because where this is going to compete with us is it's going to compete at the commodity end of the market. The cheapest possible mints products in the market are going to be disrupted. Because if this can be produced for nothing, then even the works paying 50 cents a kilo for some of this stuff is going to be more than they are willing to pay. And I think that's where I start to get a little nervous. Because it means then that the timing for us really getting out of the commodity market in the meat industry is now. And it's a bit like the best time to plant the tree was 20 years ago, failing that today. It's exactly the same with us making that transition out of that commodity market because we can see what the competition looks like at the bottom end. Okay? The other bit of competition at the bottom end is these guys. And um, I ate this, this is my burger with my bite out of it, sorry if there's any saliva. Uh, it was absolutely delicious, just want to get that across. Um, it bled, uh, it's got beet in it, it has got twice the iron of meat and it's highly bioavailable so humans can, can use that iron. It not surprisingly has fibre in it, which meat doesn't have. It has half the fat of meat and it again has double the protein. So if we want to think about how we market meat and we want to talk about the attributes of meat, like it's a protein, then we're also in trouble because the protein end is getting handled in ways that are very, very different than the way that we produce protein. 
And again, these guys have a different business model. So this is made from soy and corn and a genetically modified yeast. And that yeast binds heme, which is the iron taste in meat, the metallic taste in blood. And it binds that so that it can hold this iron and it gives the taste of blood to the point where I was sitting next to someone who's a vegan and she refused to taste it because she refused to believe it wasn't meat. Okay, now this was not better than the best meat I've ever eaten, but it was way better than pretty much any American hamburger I've ever had. And I think that's what gave me a bit of a fright, because again, I think I was being a bit dismissive about it. So these guys are plant-based meat, and what we're seeing, I think, is, is again a challenge at the lower end. The business model that makes them different is that the company, Impossible Foods, owns from the farm to the restaurant. So they're not going through any kind of processes, they're not going through distributors, there isn't like shippers, they own the entire process. And so they are capturing the whole of the value chain, not just a small piece to the farmer and a small piece to the transport company and a small piece to the processor, small piece to the distributor or the agent. They have a very different business model which means that they can get the costs down much, much lower than we will ever be able to do in the meat industry. And that means we need to find a different form of value to play with. So this is the per capita milk consumption in the US. Um, it's been on a steady decline, and 1975 was in fact the peak of milk consumption per person in the US. This kind of graph is exactly what it looks like globally in the Western world. So in the Western world, adults particularly are abandoning milk and not returning to it, and their milk consumption is dropping at a great rate. And you only have to go to any supermarket and see the 10 kinds of milk out there to see what I'm talking about. Um, and this is important because I think what's happened in the milk industry is also going to happen in the meat industry. So this is uh, the growth in milk. Um, so the blue line is milk alternatives, and um, the red line is um, white milk, so milk from, from cows. So what we're seeing is last year in the US alone, there was a 61% increase in the consumption of alternate milks, and there was a 15% decrease in the consumption of white milk, cow milk. Now, this is a global trend. Um, and again, it has big implications for us in the meat industry as well as obviously the dairy industry. So what happens is most of the time we point and laugh, which I just did, and then the second thing when we see something new is we try to regulate it. And so in the US there's this legislation in place now to say that um, milk, the word milk, can only be used for a mammary secretion from an ovine or bovine animal, which is exactly what I wanted in my latte. And I know. It's ridiculous. I just want to say, if we try to regulate this stuff, we waste our money. Because making someone put a Y in it didn't stop them from going and buying almond milk, right? They went and bought almond milk or hemp milk or oat milk or whatever milk on purpose. So it would be a complete waste of our funds in New Zealand to put money into trying to regulate the word milk. And equally, Australian farmers have just put a whole lot of their levies into fighting the use of the word meat to say that that pink slime can't be called meat and that that plant-based meat can't be called meat. Let me be clear, it's going to waste their money, right? Consumers are not accidentally buying a vegetarian burger. They didn't go, oh, that looks like a nice piece of steak. I think I'll buy that vegetarian burger. You know, they weren't mistaken. So it might f make you feel good because you feel like you're like taking it to the man and giving them a little punch. It's a complete waste of their levies. It will fail. Right? The next thing that happens is after you try to regulate, it usually doesn't work, um, is that people buy it up. So does anyone want to guess for me who is now the world's number one producer of non-dairy milk? Close, 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 close. Dan Own, yeah, thank you, Dan Own. So one of the top three producers of milk in the world, Dan Own is now the number one producer of non-dairy milk. Anyone want to guess number two for me? Coca-Cola. Ah, uh, no, you didn't see that coming, did you? All right, number three is, um, actually, I'll come back to number three. I've got a, hopefully got a slide on them. Um, actually, number three is Nestle. And what's interesting with Nestle is Nestle is also now the biggest um, investor in vegan food production in the US. And Nestle reckon from a standing start, they are going to do $5 billion of sales in vegan food in the next 10 years per year. Okay? 
So, so when you've got these big global dairy giants moving, we should kind of pay attention, right? I just want to hazard that they're not stupid, yeah? Um, and so in the US, the biggest con investors in the plant-based meat are the people who used to be the biggest investors in what they call CAFOs. So in those big feedlot farming in the US, the pictures we always see of American farms of, you know, cattle in mud being force-fed, you know, corn. Um, those guys are divesting of that. They're selling out of that as fast as they can. And the reason that they're selling out of that is because they see the bottom end of the meat market disappearing. And so Cargill, um, which was US's largest investor in CAFOs, is now the, the world's largest investor in plant-based meat. And they are moving it, and what they're doing is they're using their old relationships from being meat processors to get this plant-based meat into the meat section in the supermarket. Okay. Now, I know this all sounds a bit depressing. I promise you it's not going to stay that way. Okay, US meat consumption, not pretty. Okay, just want to get that across as well. So good curves, bad curve. That yellow curve, that one's the good curve. Does anyone want to guess what that is? Chicken. Chicken, okay. It used to be that thing we got at Christmas, you know. Now it's pretty much an everyday food all over the world. Um, that little bottom green line, that's lamb. Um, pork is the blue, and that top one is beef. So this is per person. Um, and what we're seeing is there's actually been a very slight uptick because the prices of US beef are really bad at the moment. And the reason that US beef prices at the low end are bad is because the price of corn is really, really cheap. So the more corn you feed beef, the cheaper you can produce beef. So there's some fluctuations, but it's never going to go back to that high that we've seen there. So this is really important for us to look at the curves and think, well, what are we going to do about it, right? Because getting cheaper is just off the menu. I want to make that super clear. Um, so we need to perhaps be thinking about if people are going to eat less meat, how do we get them to eat better meat? So if we want to maintain margins, one of the best ways for us to maintain margins is to produce a really premium product. We are not going to maintain margins at a volume play. But what we mean by better meat, and this is where you know it's going to play lovely, I'm, I'm glad that Sam's talking after me, um, because I'm really proud of what we're doing with beef and lamb with the red meat story. Um, if we want to be really clear about being a premium product, we have to have the best animal welfare story. We have to have the best story around our feed. We have to have the best story around free range, outdoor growing, all of those things. And the good news is it's the way we farm. What we haven't done is we haven't told the world because we take it for granted that free range, I mean, I remember thinking, oh, you've got to be joking. Why would we put free range on our beef? Like, duh, you know? Um, but we actually have to tell them these stories. We have to tell them that antibiotics are not routinely used as a fake growth hormone, which is what is common in many of the countries that we're exporting to. So we have to tell a very different story if we want to make sure that we can really get those higher prices for our meat. Um, so I mentioned Nestle. Um, one of the things I just want to quickly talk about on farm is this internet of everything. So um, last year, or this year, only 48% of the traffic on the internet was created by humans. All the rest was machine to machine. So however many of you have got a Fitbit, you know, my Fitbit talks to my iPad and it talks to my scales and sadly it talks to my husband. Um, but, you know, all these things all chat, right? And um, so that is the way of the future. I've been in at Gallagher's a bit lately and they've got their whole, like, fenceless systems with putting um, sensors onto animals. That is definitely the way things are going. Machines talking to machines. You know, the sensors, I've seen them in use out here in Canterbury, the sensors that tell the irrigator when to irrigate. Um, the ones that tell it when to turn itself off because there's enough water now or the, the you know, when we're looking at things like pH levels and applications of, of fertiliser or whatever it is, all of these machines doing this is the way of the future. And obviously we need that infrastructure in place to make it happen, but that is what a lot of farming in the future is going to look like. Um, this is a thing that I've been trialling that's on our fridge and it's from Campbell's actually. Campbell's Soup joint venture with Amazon. And every time we put something in or out of the fridge, we scan it. And when we take it out of the fridge, a replacement drops into my Amazon outbox, right, into my Amazon shopping cart. Isn't that amazing? What it does is we think about a business model. It changes my purchase from a one-off purchase to a subscription model. 
So if you think about it, what I'm doing, and, and they haven't got beer in there, much to my family's disappointment, uh, but, you know, I haven't got beer as a service. I think it was just a brilliant business model for someone, you know, deliver me a beer once a week um, or more. But, you know, that idea of what they'll do then is that um, I can see that we could integrate this easily with a lot of the packaging on our meat products. What if every time I scanned out a steak, another one dropped into my shopping cart, and then the next time I went into my Amazon, I just clicked yes or no on whether I wanted it, and it was delivered. And we currently buy avocados by subscription from the Avo Tree Company. They deliver us six avocados a week, you know. But, and, but why aren't we thinking about how those business models can change for us? And we could think differently about how we could use the technology to make it easier for our customers to buy from us. Um, Gonna just, so one of the things that happens over time is the price of everything drops. And I want you to go away with one last scary thought, which is what if the price of food dropped to zero? So this, this curve here, what it does is it shows you that the price of food relative to income has dropped markedly over the last half century. And there's no reason that that won't continue to drop. So what that means is we need to be really thinking hard about how we produce the highest possible value products in the market so that we can fight this curve. And just like Google fought AOL's downward curve, we can find ways to create an upward curve. And these are a couple of examples. That um, top one is a picture from Ansco, um, who saved one of my friend's husband's life the other day, and I wouldn't have thought of thanking them, but I did ring Sir Graham Harrison and thank him. Um, they're taking what was beef heart that used to go to pet food, they're washing it, they're doing a sterilisation process, and they now make what's called um, pericardium out of it. They make a fibre that you use to re repair valves in the human heart. It used to go into the rendering plant or to pet food, and it's now a medical application. Um, this one here, I kind of joke because I actually did buy this product. Um, and, you know, women are suckers for anything that will make you more beautiful or look younger, right? Uh, so I realised after I read the back of the box and I'd paid my 59 New Zealand dollars for it, all right, I don't look good at this moment, let me just make that really, really clear. Uh, it was pretty much a $1.49's worth of Davis gelatin. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, seriously. But Davis is only getting $1.49 for it, and these guys got 59 bucks out of me. And if they'd put grass fed on that, which I betcha if it came from New Zealand it was, I'd have paid 79 bucks for that. And that's what I mean about thinking differently about the business models. And we think we're in the meat business, but maybe we need to think quite differently about what all the rest of our ingredients could be. What else are the problems that society has, including vanity, you know, that we might want to solve? This is another one. Um, I, I took a photo of this in my local supermarket where this is imported from Australia. They actually do get another 10 bucks for their grass-fed one, which I saw yesterday. Um, and this is basically, it, it's bones boiled, then that's dried, it's powdered, and people like me will pay ridiculous amounts of money for it, and then it says grass-fed even more. And in fact, I was talking to some people two weeks ago, and they're saying that the international market for bones is out of control for two reasons. One is the emphasis on gut health, and the other one is paleo. Everyone's doing what they call bone broth, which is what my grandmother called stock, right? But if you can market this right, you can absolutely get a lot more money for it. So a lot of these things that we saw as waste products are actually highly valuable now. And those are the sorts of things we have to be thinking about in order to maintain our price over time. Um, last couple of slides, this is my favourite butcher in London, it's just down the road from my son's place. I got that call that grandmothers just love when your kid has their first baby and they go, uh, we're not really coping. I'm like, yes. Uh, you know, can you come? Sure. Can I come tomorrow? I may have cleared my diary, you know. So I flew to London, I'm super excited, I get to have a couple of weeks with the baby. Um, so it's like, you guys sleep, I'm going down to the butcher, right? So I, I go down, I, I, I take the baby in the push chair, go in and he's like, how are you darling? You know, he's got the, hip, the beard, he's the hipster with all the tats and everything. And, um, and I go, look, you know, just, they just had a baby, I'd like to make them something. He's like, she'll be needing some meat. I'm like, yeah, she'll be needing some meat. So, um, so he gives me this roast beef and then he's like, so what are you gonna have with it, darling? I'm like, I don't know, you know, what do you think I should have? And he's like, well, there's a greengrocer over the road, you should go tell them that I sent you and like, here's some herbs to put in it. And then he said, what are you gonna drink while you're cooking? I was like, brilliant, I don't know, what do you recommend? So I ended up, you can see over there, I ended up with a nice bottle of French red. And then he said, well, you're gonna need something to eat while you're cooking. I'm like, 
genius. So there's a whole set of French cheeses over there in that corner as well. So I went in for a bit of meat. I came out with this massive bag of stuff. He sent me over the road. They went, what did he tell you to do? I said this, and they sent me home with some green beans and some broccoli and some fancy salad. And I was super happy. And I probably spent, you know, 100 bucks more than I was willing to spend. But it was totally worth it, right? Of course, they're so tired because they're up all night, they eat, go to sleep. <laughs> but I felt fantastic. And I think that's the thing, is it's about the experience of the food, not just the food. And we need to be thinking about that. Um, I buy my meat from these guys. This is not saying that the rest of you don't do good meat. But I buy my meat from these guys because, one, they'll mail it to me. And I live in the middle of a city, and I never have time to go to the supermarket. And if I do, I don't want to have to lug a whole lot of stuff home. So these guys deliver to my front door. And I know that they've got good farming practices, so I feel really good when I feed it to my family. And um, you know, and my daughter went online to Google them the other day because I left her at home alone with some diced pork, and she's like, I don't know, you know, is it free range and all that stuff. And so these guys have cracked a business model, and I hope it's working for them. You know, I just want to be sure. I haven't haven't asked them if I can tell the story. I'm not saying the rest of you aren't doing this, but I love the fact that they've found a way of selling direct to their consumers. Um, I want to just do one last thing before we finish, which is that some of you may have heard the story, but um, there was a thing recently where a guy complained um, very publicly about Target and Google. And his 17-year-old daughter was getting all these ads down the side of her Gmail stream for baby gear. And you know, he sent a very public kind of message out going, you know, this is outrageous, she's 17, she's a very good girl blah, 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 you know, she's clearly not pregnant. And Target came back and said, she's pregnant. And he's like, no, she's not, she's a really good girl, nah, 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 nah. you know, the girl says, no, I'm not pregnant. Um, and Target goes, no, she's pregnant. Like, we know that if you buy cotton balls, unscented lotion and mineral supplements, you're pregnant, right? <laughs> and she was, she just hadn't yet, like, had any of the symptoms of pregnancy. And what's interesting about that is some of you might think, that is creepy, and the rest of you will be going, wow, that's amazing, right? And so I'm in the wow, that's amazing camp, and the reason I think it's wow, that's amazing is that we know an awful lot about our customers. Our customers go through the supermarket, and we see what they buy with our meat. They go to a butcher, we know what else they're buying while they're there. There is a ridiculous amount of data out there about our customers and about where they go and what they do, and yet as an industry, we hardly use it. And so we could be using the data that already exists to predict the kinds of cuts people want, to predict the kinds of flavours that people want, and to really use that to make sure that we are not just guessing in the dark about how to move up the value chain, but actually using the kind of the science world that I live in and the math world that I live in to use those numbers to find out where is the sweetest spot for the best meat that I can possibly produce at the highest possible price. So. I want to leave you with this because I think that um, regardless of this kind of doom and gloom, there is always going to be a market for ridiculously good tasting, highly ethically produced, beautiful meat. And that may not mean that, you know, it may mean we don't feed the masses. But if you want to feed the masses, and I don't mean necessarily internally, I mean globally, if we decide that we want to feed as many people as possible, then we have to accept that we're going to get lower and lower returns for our return on equity. We're going to get lower and lower returns for our effort, and we're going to be disrupted by things like cloned meat and, and meat that has come from plants. Because those guys will always be able to produce it cheaper than we do. So for us, if we want to play in that volume market, I think we're absolutely screwed. Let me make that utterly clear. But we have a massive opportunity because the other countries that are trying to play premium, they have to change their farm systems to look like ours in order to do it. So if we get it together, we've already got at least a three to five year jump on everybody else. We just have to be really consistent about the story and we have to be super consistent about that best tasting, incredible product every time. So finally, we always overestimate what's going to change in the next couple of years, and we underestimate what's going to happen in the next 10. And I'm going to put my money down now and say within the next two to five years, you're going to go home one night and someone is going to serve you plant-based meat. And you're going to think it's delicious. And you're going to be shocked. And it's going to be a bit like that moment that you decided, someone in the past decided to buy their first car, which meant swapping out the stables for the horses to the car. And they always thought it was ridiculous. And then the moment came where it was completely normal. Thank you.